Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. I am in the Detroit airport, of all places, uh, heading back home after a week of working with a client on site in the Detroit area, and uh, figured I'd do a round of uh, questions here in the airport. There are several in here in the queue that require really short answers that are really simple and straightforward and to the point. So let's go get it. And also I wanted to show that, you know, travel and consulting isn't always glamorous. Sometimes I'm stuck in an airport at 7 p.m. on a Friday night trying to get home to Vegas. Um, so the top voted question is from SQL Learner who asks, Hi Brent, I'm curious about the two versions of Constant Care, the Free Basics Edition versus the Full Edition. What are the differences and who's it suited for? It's really simple. The free version focuses on health, like do you have backups, do you have database corruption? And the pro version focuses on performance, uh, which allows you to do make index changes, query changes, and so forth. Next up, Harold asks, is there any good reliable tool or plugin, preferably by Microsoft, that you've used where we can control, uh, do version control for tables, stored procs, and functions? Um, yes, Redgate is pretty much the world standard out there. If you search for Redgate schema, uh, you'll find the options on that. It is a paid tool. Uh, Microsoft has some that are integrated in various editions of Visual Studio. I haven't used them. I hear decent things about them, I just don't have any clients who've used them. So there you go. Uh, next up, Concern asks, Hi Brent, a few years ago developers couldn't write complex queries, so I as a SQL Server expert wrote them. These days AI does it much faster. Is this the end of my job? If the only thing you did was write queries, you probably don't have a bright future. Um, you pro but I would also say, though, if you called yourself a SQL Server expert and the only thing that you could do is write queries, then you're probably in for a brutal surprise about what all SQL Server can do. And I'm just going to give you a few examples. If you call yourself an expert, you should be able to design indexes, tune indexes, interpret weight stats, make server level performance improvements, uh, pick the right isolation levels, pick the right compatibility levels, do performance monitoring and more. So careful there with the calling it an expert. I'll give you an example uh, this week. So I was on site at a client. They actually use chat GPT to design a new database infrastructure, to design the new tables and views and so forth. And they brought me in to because they were like, okay, chat GPT gave us a quick first idea. Uh, and it worked pretty well. But then we spent five days straight uh, making changes to that database structure uh, based on what they know, based on what I know, based on questions that we asked about the business and so forth. So next up, Curious DBA says, I saw your post that you no longer tweet. What prompted this decision? Uh, two words, Elon Musk. I do not uh, condone anything that that bozo does. So that's the end of that. A junior DBA says, Hi Brent, you often say to document your planned and unplanned failovers with screenshots so that any admin can do it. What's the best way you've seen teams keep all that DBA documentation organized in versions? Versioned Google Docs. Google Docs is so good at what I would call multiplayer word processing that lots of people can work in a document at the same time also works really well for live troubleshooting and outage because everybody can write their notes about the troubleshooting that they're doing and then a project manager or team lead can watch that Google Doc and summarize it for stakeholders rather than getting everybody involved to stop what they're doing and talk about it. Next up, my coffee got cold says, I have databases in read-only mode, so why do the sizes of differential backups change? I think one of two things is probably happening. Somebody's probably taking it out of read-only mode and making changes to it, uh, which is entirely possible. Like anybody can, I say anybody, anybody with sysadmin level permissions can pop it in and out of read-only. The other might be that the size is so inconsequential, like that SQL Server is just tracking the, the version number perhaps, 
I, and that I wouldn't worry about it. So I guess it's one of those two extremes. There might be other answers, but those are the two I would immediately think of. Next, Dupinder says, we are forced to use linked servers due to architecture decisions made years ago. What are your top tips for improving linked server query performance between two SQL servers? Dupinder, I don't have any. That's like saying, I want to run with scissors. What are your best tips to win a marathon while running with scissors? Dupinder, I don't have any. It's time to start working on the hard problem of pulling out that architecture and putting in a better one. Next, my T got cold asks, aside from hacking in batch mode, have you ever found a use for a column store index on a table with less than one million rows? Yes, read-only tables. Tables that were completely read-only used for configuration and we frequently needed to group stuff um, like configuration tables with stores around the world. A uh, company with tens of thousands of, I'm going to call them stores, but think like kiosks, uh, and that they needed to repeatedly run grouping queries and they couldn't cache them in the front end. It worked pretty well for them. Rare, though. Not a TempDB asks, on a brand new database, what are the reasons to use a collation other than a default? Um, uh, different languages. Um, languages that require case sensitivity is a really quick classic example. Next up, AG Avoider says, how is data loss possible on a failover clustered instance? Your worksheet says it is, but I can't imagine it. Um, the worksheet, if I remember right, says zero to one second. And I do that just because there are gotchas with the other methods that are involved in there, but not failover clustering. The failover clustering, as long as the commit goes back to the application, you're good to go. Also assuming that you're not doing stupid something stupid like delay dur durability. Next up, DBA in action says, I'm trying to shrink a 25 terabyte database by 40%. Um, I understand why you would try to do that if you have, say, 10 terabytes worth of empty space. However, the strategies involved with doing that are beyond what I can answer quickly in an office hours question. If you have, as your question describes, a 25 terabyte database with six AG replicas, that's multiple millions of dollars worth of infrastructure that's when it's time to bring in a consultant. So by all means, I'd love to help. Go to brentozar.com, click consulting up at the top of the screen, but it's way beyond what I can answer quickly here. Uh, next up, Eddie asks, uh, oh, whoop, lost it there. Many of the SQL DBA jobs want reporting experience in SSIS or Power BI. Is that common? No, but it is common for companies to call DBA for or use DBA as a title for people who work with databases. Uh, just like uh, you might call anyone who works in medicine a doctor, um, but then also mathematicians are also doctors or, or uh, psychiatrists or other things like that. Brent's Lungs Got Cold asks, have you ever seen a basic availability group used for disaster recovery uh, in combination with a failover clustered instance for high availability? Yes. Um, says, continues, I can see some benefits over log shipping, but I don't know how well they mix. They mix fine. Failover clusters and bags work totally fine. Uh, next up, Mike says, are there professional associations for people working with databases, specifically SQL Server and or the Azure SQL Stack? Not that I'm aware of, not professional associations. There was something called PASS, which stood for the Professional Association for SQL Server, but they even stopped calling themselves PASS because there were legal requirements around calling yourself a professional association. I'm not aware of any. Um, I am aware of professional associations for people who work with databases, period, like any stack, but not what you're describing. Uh, next up, Kyle Dev DBA says, in a recent office hours, you mentioned that you run LLMs locally. What has been your experience with the performance of these models? I use a Mac, and so I run a Mac, the, like the best CPUs that I can get, and the laptop has 128 gigs of RAM. 
it still doesn't approach what you can get with ChatGPT or Claude or Gemini. Those models are so much faster. Um, but I use local models in the cases where with, I'm working with client stuff and the client agrees that I'm allowed to use an LLM, but I'm not allowed to use a corporate LLM where my, their data may get used for training or that I can't guarantee it won't get used for training. So in those cases, I don't really care about performance. I'm doing it for things like, can you rewrite this code for me while I go and get some coffee? The performance is, if it saves me 20 minutes of manual labor uh, by redoing something while I'm on a coffee break or in the background doing other tasks, then I'm totally fine with it. Uh, let's see here. Next up, Mike says, I've got a shared system that supports multiple clients. When I import data from one client, that often causes us to need to rerun statistics affecting other clients. What's your take on partitioning by client ID and then only updating stats by those tables by a specific client ID? Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You can update stats at the partition level, but that doesn't affect, last time I looked, doesn't, which was like 10 years ago, doesn't affect the stats that are used, uh, the 200 histogram bucket stats for the entire table. Um, so what I would question is, if you're importing data for a client, do you really expect stats to be perfectly accurate across the entire table as soon as you're done importing data? That's not really realistic, unfortunately. If you do want that that badly, you're going to want to look at partitioned views rather than partition tables. It's a feature that doesn't get a lot of massive appeal because it hasn't changed since SQL Server 2000, but it achieves exactly what you're looking for because you're able to set up stats on each table, uh, which gets you much more statistics histogram buckets. Uh, Bandu asks, what's your opinion of the new native support for JSON in SQL Server 2025? It literally just shipped two days ago, like the previews just shipped two days ago. It's not very well documented, and I don't have any clients who need it. So as a result, it is way at the bottom of the list of things that I'm looking at for SQL Server 2025. I'm focused on the things that have much more widespread appeal, uh, things like the changes to parameter sensitive plan optimization, optional parameter plan optimization, features like that. Next up, Cam asks, hi Brent, my friend has a table that asks what acts as a cache with a one hour lifetime. Expired data is removed frequently. In testing, they see frequent stats updates causing bad performance. External caching is on the roadmap. Any tips in the meantime? Sure, disable automatic stats updates. With a cache, you're generally saying, here's a key, give me a value, and you're just expecting one row to return. In that case, you don't really need accurate stats. Stats from any point should give you estimates of one row. If you're doing something more complex than that, where you think you need accurate stats and you're returning multiple rows, that's probably not a cache. You're probably doing something else. There's nothing wrong with that. I would just need a whole lot more background information on what you're trying to do because it wouldn't be caching. Caching is key value type stuff. Uh, next up, Accidental DBA says, general best practice question, Return one. I'm returning one record with the sorting done on SQL Server. Should I do the sorting on SQL Server or should I push a thousand rows down to the app and have the app sort to get the final record? My query plans for testing only show a very minor difference with the C, C -sharp short sort being slightly better. Sounds like you answered the question there, my friend. Sounded like you did testing and you know which one is better. So the good news is you did testing. The bad news is, is you're asking someone else to do work for you after you already did the testing. The real answer is the friends we made along the way and I am not your friend.
Ricardo says, uh, Ricardo asks, what are the signs to look for when it's time to find a new job? Um, in my personal experience, by the time I've even asked myself the question, should I look for a new job? That means you're well, that means that I was well past the time when I should have looked for a new job. It's really hard in this economy because there are a lot of problems getting jobs. You know, there are lots of layoffs happening everywhere. So the time to look for a new job is when you have a job, but you're not happy. You still are at least successfully employed. Go start passively looking now while you're still getting a paycheck. Because once you stop getting a paycheck, like if you get fired, it is going to be way harder to find your next job. Uh, DW King says, hi Brent, yourself and many others mentioned that fabric isn't production ready and it has many issues. What would you recommend for a company setting up a new data warehouse from scratch in 2025? Man, I really wish there was a one-line answer for everyone to use Product X when you're building a data warehouse. But building a data warehouse is a multi-year project that usually involves millions of dollars worth of labor and expenses. You don't want a quick one-line answer for that. You want to hire in a consultant who does that kind of work. To be clear, I do not. But there are plenty of companies that do specialize in those kinds of implementations. Contact a few of those companies and start to hire them for advising you along that journey. Uh, let's see here. Next up, Devin says, uh, what are your pros and cons on working on a team of DBAs versus working as a lone DBA? And which did you prefer? When you want to learn, work around other people, especially other people who are sharper than you and who can teach you things. Um, when you feel like you're done learning uh, and you don't enjoy working with other people, uh, then being a lone DBA can be more effective because you're able to get more done quickly without having anybody else in the way. Um, I personally, I think I prefer working on a team of DBAs because I love to learn. Oh man, I love watching how other people do stuff. Uh, it inspires me to be more creative and more, uh, you know, think more out of the box. So by far and away, I think that's my favorite. And then we have two others, you know, the two others are kind of professional development type questions. And because we've been going for quite a while, I'm going to stop here. I've got, oh, and I have about 20 minutes before my flight board. So just enough time to go, uh, go hit the restrooms. It's always nicer to hit the restrooms before you go get on the plane instead of having to pee in that tiny little cabinet at like 25,000 feet. Um, so I'm off to fly back home from Detroit to Las Vegas. Thankfully, it's a nonstop flight and I'm settled in on first class. So I will see y'all on the next office hours. Adios.